As you all know, we've been in a series, we're in the middle of the series, on the book of James. If you don't have a Bible with you and you would like one during the message, because you might need one, there are English and Spanish Bibles available. Um, Anna Ruth can help you find them. Do take the time to get one, um, because you might want to refer back to the passage as Nate talks. Nate's asked me to read the verses for today. We are in James chapter 2. I will be reading verses 14 through 26. James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that, and shudder. You foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together, and his faith was made complete by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And he was, call, he was called God's friend. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. In the same way was not even Rahab the prostitute considered righteous for what she did when she gave lodging to the spies and sent them off in a different direction. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without deeds is dead. Thank you, Marilyn. And uh, good morning again. Thanks for being here at Christ Church on this beautiful morning. Um, but, but before I start, I think uh, I need to give someone 15 seconds of fame. So right before, uh, like five seconds ago, I asked uh, David to come up here. He has no idea what he's doing, but it's something really easy. Okay, co come on up, David. So first, I just want to ask you a couple of questions. Do you know that this chair will hold you up? Yes. Yes. How do you know that? How do you know that I didn't unscrew the screws? Mm, because I had a past experience. <laughs> so I think you don't know for sure, <laughs> but you believe that it will. Yes, I do. You expect that it will. Yes, I do. Okay, then try it. Wait, but wait, Jean Claude, can we have a drum roll? Can we have some a drum roll? Some sort of. Yeah, there we go. There we go. All right, go ahead. Try it. Very good. Give him a round of applause. That's all I needed. Have a seat. Hopefully, your other seat holds you up too. So that right there was faith. So if you're paying attention to the passage that Marilyn just read, you notice that the big key word, the big buzzword is faith. The passage asks the question, what is true and legitimate faith? And so I thought it was extremely important for us to define what faith is before we start talking about that, right? So uh, Hebrews 11.1 1 actually defines faith for us really well. So I, I love this translation, the way it brings out uh, the meaning from the Greek. It says, faith assures us of things we expect, and it convinces us of the existence of things we cannot see. I'm going to say that again. It says, faith assures us of things we expect and convinces us of the existence of things we can't see. So David, even though he had a lot of confidence, he didn't know for sure he couldn't know for sure that the chair would hold him up. But he was assured of what he expected because of faith. But not faith based on nothing. A faith from evidence. If you've heard of uh, Bill Maher, he's a guy that's made his living on attacking faith. He says that Christian faith is the purposeful suspension of critical thinking. How many of us have heard something similar to that? That, that faith is just uh, blindly believing in fairy tales that, uh, you know, you have to ignore reality and logic and reason. How many of us have heard that before? 
A lot of us. And the thing is, Bill Maher couldn't be more wrong because faith is actually based on critical thinking. It's based on evidence. Faith isn't so silly because we actually use faith every single day, all the time. When the sun sets in the evening, we have faith that it'll come up the next day. There's no way we can know that for sure. But we are assured of something that we expect. And when you're in a plane, we have faith that it doesn't just fall from the sky, right? But there are invisible forces at play, right, that make flight possible. So we are convinced of the existence of things that we cannot see. But why? This isn't faith based on nothing. There's reason to trust these things. History and personal experience tell us that the sun will come up the next day. Scientists with impressive credentials tell us that those invisible forces that make flight possible, if those are there, you won't fall out of the sky. David, you didn't just guess based on nothing. You've seen chairs like this hold people up before, right? And you see that it has all four legs, etc. There was reason for you to have faith in it because there was faith from evidence. Likewise, you cannot prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that Christianity is true. There, I said it. But you also can't prove that it isn't. But our faith in the truth of Christianity in the Bible, in Jesus, etc., that's faith based on convincing evidence. So we can be confident and assured of the things we expect, and we can be convinced of the existence of things that are unseen. So if anyone ever asks me why I believe, I have a whole slew of options for them, right? There's the evidence from science. There's evidence from history, archaeology, the reliability of Scripture. Jesus fulfilled 300-plus prophecies from the Old Testament. There's the existence of ethics in the world. And the Bible says the evidence for the historical resurrection is our evidence for our resurrection. Because the Father resurrected Jesus, we can have faith. We have reason to believe that he will come back and do the same with us, with the same power. What we learn from James 2 is that just as we should have faith from evidence, we should also have faith, evidence from faith. So just as there should be faith from evidence, there should also be evidence from our faith. Because James says the shocking Faith without works is dead. Uh Uh-oh, say that again. Faith without works is dead. But you might say, hello, excuse me, Nate, uh, isn't that the opposite? (laughs) Isn't that the opposite of what Paul says? Hello, question. uh, My favorite Bible verse, doesn't it say that it's faith without works that saves? Doesn't James contradict Paul? Doesn't change contradict Paul. How many of you have heard someone say, well, I cannot trust in Christianity because the Bible has so many contradictions? Who's heard that before? Well, the first thing you do with someone that says that, you say, well, such as? Can you give me an example? And most of the time, you'll get, ah, there's, shoot, there's that one, I don't know. But if they can give you an example, they might point to this. I mean, look at it. James says a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. But Paul said to the Romans, a person is justified by faith apart from works. James says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? And he answers that pretty plainly. Faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But you're right. Paul says, it's by grace you have been saved, not by works. This isn't something that you did. It's a gift from God. That way no one can boast. So which is it? Which is it? I want you to uh, picture yourself in the waiting room of a doctor's office, okay? So let's, let's say there's, there's two 
rooms, each with a different patient. And let's say the doctor has a very booming voice and he leaves the doors cracked so you can hear everything he's saying. So he walks into the first room and he tells that patient, son, I need you to stay inside, stay in bed, and don't be active. You need to stop trying to move around so much. Okay, then he walks out of that room and enters the second room and tells that patient, listen, dude, you need to get out of bed, get outside, and get active. You need to get moving. Contradiction. You can't trust that doctor. Contradiction, right? Not necessarily. There are different instructions for different patients. This patient over here in room number one, he has the flu with a high fever, but he's one of those people that just, he feels like he can't uh, afford to be sick, right? He's just got to keep going, keep working. We know people like that. But then the guy over here in, in room number two, he isn't sick at all. He doesn't have the flu. He's just heavy, and he plays video games all day. <laughs> you see, the letters that we have from the apostles, they're to specific groups that have specific problems that they want to correct. So Paul, he's addressing lost people. He's focused on the question, how do we become Christians? He's talking to people who say, I need to be doing a lot of stuff, right? I can't afford to not get moving. But they're sick. And Paul wants them to be healed. They're lost and orphaned, and Paul wants them to be found and adopted. But then James, he's talking to lazy religious people. He's focused on the question, how should Christians be? How should we be if we truly are Christians? So he's talking to people in church who say, Whoa, I don't need to do anything, right? Wouldn't want to move too much. But they're not sick, and James wants them to be active. They're found and adopted, and he wants them to act like it, to pitch in around the house. So we need to recognize, first of all, that that Paul and James, they're, they're friends, they're teammates. They're on the exact same page with the same theology. But more importantly... When they sat down to write scripture, they were guided by the exact same perfect Holy Spirit. And they wrote down exactly what the Lord wanted them to write. So Paul actually agrees with James. Paul agrees with James. You see, if you continue on in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, you see it says, Yes, you were saved by grace through faith without works so that you can do good works. And Paul tells Titus, I want you to insist on this teaching, that every single person that trusts in God should be devoted to doing good works. And James agrees with Paul. See, James couldn't be saying that we could somehow work hard enough or be good enough to earn our salvation because that's impossible. He says even a person that only breaks one of God's laws is just as bad as someone that's broken all of them. And James, including himself, says, We all stumble in many ways, for all have sinned, and we've fallen from reaching God's glory. And here's the the kicker. James says, I will show you my faith by my works. And Paul agrees. He says, The only thing that matters, the only thing that counts, is faith expressing itself through love. Faith with evidence. And more importantly, they both agree with Jesus. Jesus said, whoever believes in me is saved, period. But he also says, whoever loves me will keep my commandments. And just like James said, faith without works is dead, Jesus said, someone with faith and no works is just like a dead branch. So somehow it's both. It's faith without works, and faith with works. And we'll look at how to make sense of that in a minute. But first, the problem that we see James having is that people are choosing one or the other. In verse 18, he says, But someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Someone will pipe up and say, You know what? Sounds good, James. You take care of the faith department. We'll work on the works department. Or, our church is more, more of a faith church, and that church 
downtown or across the, across the city. They're more of a works church. So let's look at these two sides because we, we have the same types of, of things today, right? So we have the all faith, no works people and the all works, no faith people. We have the all faith fanatics first. The all faith fanatics. So you might hear people saying, you know, I believe in God, but not in any particular religion. In other words, I believe in a higher power, but I don't want that to affect how I live. I believe God exists, but I still am going to live how I have always lived. I can still cheat on my tests. I can still trust in my energy stones. I don't need to serve people in need. I don't need to treat my coworker with love and patience. And there are some pretty smart Christians out there, too, who say, listen, of course I believe that Jesus is the Son of God and he paid it all. For that reason, I don't need to go to church. That's legalism. Don't want to be a Pharisee now. I don't need to pray because the Lord is sovereign. He's got it all taken care of. I don't need to give because the Lord will provide. I don't need to stop getting drunk at parties because, hey, I'm a sinner saved by grace. Let's just kick back and take it easy and wait for Jesus to come back. But Jesus says, or sorry, James says, you have faith with no works, big whoop. Big whoop, what good does that do? He says, just as there's faith from evidence, there should be evidence from your faith. And his first illustration is in verse 15. He says, suppose a brother or sister, a fellow believer, they're without clothes, and daily food. And then one of you says, hey, go, I wish you well. Keep warm, keep well fed. But then he does nothing about his physical needs. What good is that? You know, maybe this is someone in your small group or in your family, and you give them some Bible verses, you give them some Christian sayings, yes, the Lord will provide. God brings everything together and works it for good. Praying you get some food. Hope you find a coat to probably say, gee, thanks. <laughs> what good does that do when you have a closet full of coats and a fridge full of food? James says that's like dead faith. And then he takes it even further. He says, so I hear you believe that there is one God. Good. Even the demons believe that. And they shudder. So you have faith without works. Congratulations, your faith is as good as a demon's. And uh, how's that working out for them? You see, when we read of the encounters that Jesus had with demons in the Gospels, we see that they actually have pretty good theology. They were a lot more on track than than the religious people, right? Uh, For example, here in Matthew, the demons acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, and they know about the appointed time. They know something about the salvation plan. You know, if demons were to write theological books about Jesus or or God or whatever, uh, they would actually be a lot better than some of the books we can find in Christian bookstores, right? The difference is what do they do with that faith? Instead of believing and then devoting themselves to following and doing what pleases him, they believe and then they devote themselves to rebelling and hating him and doing what displeases him. Sound familiar? Now we have our all-works people, our all-works warriors. You know, in in Paul's day, there were people who went around saying they were Christians, and they said, listen, here's your checklist. Here's your religious checklist. This is what you have to do to get saved. And we have people that are similar to that today. We have people that claim to be Christians that say, yeah, Jesus did a lot on that cross, but you kind of need to meet him somewhere in the middle. You need to earn it. Be nicer, try harder, get baptized, confess your sins, go on missions, don't go to casinos, don't do drugs, don't mess up too much, or you're out. Good luck. You see, if salvation could be earned through works, which it can't be, then it would open the door, like Paul said, to pride, to boasting on the one side, right? Hey, everyone, look at me, I won, I got my salvation, I earned it. And on the other side, despair. Don't look at me. I failed. I lost my salvation. 
But there are all kind of all kinds of religions out there that say, "Hey, be a good person, burn this incense, get fasting, pray this prayer three times, five times a day, pay off your karmic debt, kill this chicken, give your alms to the poor." You need to do something. And if you work hard enough, you just might save yourself. This is every religion. You go to any religion and they will hand you your to-do list. And this is the huge difference between true Christianity and every other faith. You know, when I, when I ride Ubers, inevitably, the first thing that happens is, oh, you're not from here. Why are you here and what do you do? which I can tell a lot of the times they really regret asking that because now church is brought up and it's their fault for asking. <laughs> but what do they say? What's their two cents about it all most of the time? You know, really every religion is the same at the end of the day. Christianity is no different, right? How many of us have heard that? Just Liz, okay. <laughs> a lot of us. But the thing is, they're about as the same as an elephant and a house fly. You know, they're about as the same as these two kitchens. A little different. You see, every religion says, do, get working. There's a lot to do. But the Bible says, it's been done, get living. It's done, get living. Every faith except for true Christianity is works-based because Scripture tells us that there's no way you could be good enough. There's no way you can work hard enough to reach the standard of perfection that God has. We've all disobeyed, and we all deserve the penalty for that. But Jesus came down, and he died, and he paid that penalty for us. This grace is a free gift. It's something that we did not deserve. We just put our trust in him. So you see the first person, the all-faith and no-works person, the all-faith fanatic. They're all head and no hands. And that shows that there's no heart. So they're all head. Hey, I acknowledge that Jesus paid it all. Good. But there are no hands. But I don't really need to change the way I live. Not so good that reveals that there's really not change on the heart level. It's like if a bride said, I do, on her wedding day, but then never lived with her husband, never talks to her husband, she never serves her husband, and she goes out with other guys. You might say, listen, based on what I'm seeing, it doesn't look like you love your husband. And you say, oh, no, you can't judge my heart. I sure do. I don't know. It's like if I asked David, do you have faith that this chair will hold you up? He said, absolutely. But then I said, okay, good. then sit down. Oh, no, 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 no. Then he just has trust in his head. But until he trusts by taking action to actually sit down, does he really trust in his heart? You see, inside belief results in outside action. Inside belief results in outside action. So until he takes that step and takes the action to sit down, he does not really have faith. He has faith in his own footing. And doesn't that sound a lot like our all-works warriors? They have faith in their own footing, in their own stability, in their own efforts. The second person, the all-works warriors, the all-works and no-faith people, they're all hands and no head. And that also shows that there's no heart. They're all hands. I need to change my life. Good. But they're no head. I don't truly acknowledge that Jesus paid at all. Not so good. That also shows that there's no change on the heart level. But you see, God is not just interested in your head. And he's not just interested in your hands. God is interested in your head and your hands because he's ultimately after your heart. God wants 
your head and your hands because he ultimately wants your heart. So just as there should be faith from evidence, there also should be evidence from our faith. So it's not faith or works. We've covered that. But it's both. But we need to be careful of the order, okay? James says that it's the evidence, works are the evidence that there is faith. So if you saw a tree with no leaves and no fruit, <laughs> you can imagine it. If there's a tree with no fruit and no leaves, you can probably assume that it is dead, right? If you just, just by looking at it. And the same thing could be said of a tree with leaves and fruit on the other side. You say, that's probably a live tree. See, when we're more like Jesus, it shows everyone that we truly know him. But if a tree claims to be alive but looks dead, is it really alive? So we need to be careful of the order. A pastor once used the distinction between works that compete with faith and works that complete faith. See, many people, they try to bear the fruits to get the roots. They try to bear the fruits and then get the roots. So they they try to work, they try to do the works to get Jesus. But if you can imagine a tree trying to bear fruit with no roots, trying to get roots, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't make any sense. Similarly, listen, Jesus said, no branch can bear fruit by itself. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So we need to get the roots, then the fruits. We need to get the roots, and then we'll bear fruits. We need to get Jesus, and then we can do good works. We get Jesus, and then the works will flow as evidence that we truly have him. And how do we get Jesus? Faith without works. We acknowledge that we've disobeyed God. We acknowledge that we deserve the penalty. We acknowledge that Jesus paid that penalty for us. Then we devote ourselves to living life the way he wants us to live instead of our way because we've been truly changed. That's faith with works. So then practically, what does a truly saved life look like? What does a changed life look like? Well, the last verse in James 1 says true worship is looking after the orphan and the widow and also staying unpolluted by the world. So it's kind of twofold. True worship, being a true believer, it's it's being more like Jesus and being less like the world. It's loving more and hating less. It's more serving others and less serving yourself. It's more humility and less pride. It's more integrity and less corruption. More generosity and less hoarding. It's more wisdom and less foolishness. And it's more self-control and less out of control. Because remember, Jesus said, if you love me, you will follow my commandments And what are his commandments? To love God and to love others. And Jesus said, when you love, the world will know that you are with me. So just like there's reason to believe in Jesus, a true believer with true faith will give people reason to believe that they belong to him. So if your outward love can convince people of something they cannot see, that's changed heart, then it gives them reason to believe that you're sent by a God of love. So the thing is, we we believers, we Christians, we are not perfect, but we are different. Just like Abraham and Rahab that we just read about in James, they weren't perfect, but they were different. And faith, working itself through works, is the difference. So I invite you to to pray with me, and uh, after I pray, we're just going to have a a prolonged space to just uh, to digest, to reflect, and to think and pray, um, however you uh, want to use that time. Um, But I think uh, we need to praise this God.
that's given us this this great gift, you know? God, thank you so much for this grace. We could never earn it, and we don't deserve your whole redemption plan, but you came up with it because you love us. And God, I ask that you would be working through us. We recognize that we can absolutely do nothing good by ourselves. We can't stop doing bad by ourselves. We need you, Jesus, to be our vine. Give us nutrients. God, I ask that you would inspire us to be truly different, to look like you. In your name, amen.